By June 1644, the ancient city of York was a city under siege, surrounded on all sides by parliamentary and Scottish armies. It awaited its fate, and its fate rested upon the faint hope of a royalist army marching to its aid. York's part in the English Civil War, or the War of the Three Kingdoms, as it's usually now called, was crucial. Just prior to the outbreak of war in, in 1642, Charles I had established a royal court in York, and York old heartedly supported the king and his cause. But York had a strong and well defended city with key to holding power in the north, and whoever occupied it would control the lands, the towns, and the fortresses in the region. York remained loyal to the king until mid July 1644 when events dramatically changed the uh, tenancy of the city. When the King moved south to continue the war, uh, he appointed the Marquis of Newcastle as overall commander of his northern forces, and whilst the parliamentarian armies came under control of the father and son partnership of Ferdinando and Thomas Fairfax, so by April 1644 it seemed the time was ripe uh, to finally take control of York from the Royalists. But King Charles had already foreseen this and issued orders for the York to be garrisoned, refortified, and well stocked to withstand a long siege. The Marquis of Newcastle withdrew to York with his army. He took command of the forces in and around the city and waited for the parliamentary besiegers to arrive. The siege officially began in April 1644 when the armies of Fairfax and the army of the Scottish Covenanters, commanded by the Earl of Leven, moved into positions on the east and west of the city, respectively. The Scots had already rallied, uh, rallied themselves with Parliament to fight against the King, and sent the army to northern England in January 1644 in that support. However, these two armies, which may have numbered up to 30,000 men, were not enough to completely surround the city of York and a large open swathe of land between the rivers Foss and Ouse, north of the city, remained unoccupied. Standing cavalry patrols were established, but it was five weeks before Parliament sent another army, the Army of the Eastern Association, commanded by the Earl of Manchester, who were able to plug the gap. By June the 4th, the city of York had finally been completely encircled by all the parliamentarian um, armies in the north. To help defend the city, the Marquis of Newcastle's men on the garrison had been busy stockpiling food supplies, weapons and ammunition. They also dug new defences, barricaded posterns and gates, and built some small forts in strategic positions on the main thoroughfares into York. They also placed gunnery positions on the high points of the city, places like Clifford's Tower, Bale Hill and the main part of the city and even some church towers received gun platforms, observation platforms. Thus they waited and prayed that a relief force sent by the King and commanded by his nephew Prince Rupert would arrive before the parliamentarians could break down the walls and take the city by force. The parliamentarian siege plan was to take the outlying defensive positions one by one and tighten the noose. Uh, until only the medieval walls themselves remained to breach. The Scottish army and Manchester's army were well stocked with cannon and ammunition, but Fairfax had to borrow some cannon from the Scots and set up batteries facing Wal Walmgate Bar. However, to buy time and give Prince Rupert's army a chance to make up ground, the Marquis of Newcastle entered into a truce. Uh, and began negotiations with the parliamentarians. After a week of stalling talks and pointless meetings, the parliamentarians realised the ruse and ended the ceasefire. Now, more determined than ever to take the city by force, the parliamentarian armies moved up gear and readied themselves for an all-out attack. The signal for the attack was the explosion of two mines, one here at Warmgate and one at St Mary's Tower on the other side of the city. Um, it's a surprise attack in two locations, was designed to split the forces inside and delay any attempts to secure the breach. 
Uh, unfortunately, the armies of Fairfax and Manchester had either not finalised their timings or had not communicated the plan correctly to those officers in charge of the mining operations. Whatever the plan was, the mine under St Mary's exploded prematurely on the Sunday morning of the 16th of June. We'll have a look at Warmgate and we'll point out some, uh, some things about the actual gate itself. Okay, so here we are at uh, Warmgate Bar. Uh, as I say, this bar was damaged completely um, and we rebuilt in 1648-1649. And in fact, if we zoom in up there, we'll still see some original uh, shots against the actual tower, which were a musket fire. Um, but the, the major damage was obviously caused by cannon fire on both sides of the, the barbican on the right hand side and the left hand side were reduced down almost to about a third of the original height which you see now uh, so a lot of this work is rebuilt work dating from after the civil war one interesting aspect is the the wall here which is the base of the the barbican wall outside uh, i don't know whether you can see there but i'll zoom in and you may be able to see a slight dip in the actual wall itself where the, the, the mortar and the bricks have collapsed slightly. This we think was the position of the, the underground mine um, that was dug by the par parliamentarians during the siege. It was uh, counter flooded by the besiegers in order to dampen it down and fill it with rocks and rubble so that it couldn't be used. And in fact, it was never exploded, unlike St. Mary's mine. And in fact, the besiegers destroyed some of the suburbs to deny access to the parliamentarians for use, either as snipers or as gunnery positions. Um, but in fact, we have uh, records that say there was a battery located just along the 1079 there in St. Lawrence's churchyard, uh, which where those trees are now. So a small battery was in fact situated there, which continued to harass um, the defenders uh, until they were called away to the, uh, to the battle at Marston Moor. We'll leave Warmgate Bar and we'll make our way through the city uh, to St. Mary's and Bootham. And we'll look at that as, as a separate incident. Although, as I say, it was supposed to be tied in with the explosion of a mine here. So we'll see it over there. Well, here we are inside the Abbey Walls, um, which were constructed in uh, 1266, with the defensive towers being added in around 1320. Um, but again, we stipulate that these are not city walls. These are the Abbey Walls that surrounded the uh, St. Mary's Abbey, one of the biggest and richest in the area. Uh, and these were part of its defensive outlook. As I said, the walls around here were lightly defended, probably just with men with muskets and grenades on top of the walls. Uh, there was some light cannon down at St. Olive's Church, uh, which is down just St. Mary Gate there. Uh, an observation platform was situated there. And this was a, a target for some of the gunnery by Manchester's army, who, uh, who regularly bounced cannonballs off this part of the wall. Um, but part of the problem of the plan of blowing the mine was the fact that the actual tower was outside the confines of the, the city walls. So even if they had won the battle here uh, and took control of the King's Manor area, they still wouldn't have been within the city walls. And all the, all the royalists had to do was withdraw any men into the Bootham city wall area uh, and they would still have a strong defensive area um, to defend. So a strategic flaw in Manchester's plan, or in the parliamentarian plan, um, was not really to concentrate the mine under Bootham Bar, as at Warmgate, uh, which would have caused more destruction and devastation and would have allowed any troops entering the city to be actually in the city themselves and not in the outskirts and suburbs which were they were here um, and it's strange that that was done because they would have had information that this was just an outer abbey wall and not a city wall 
and it, seem, it seemed odd that they took this position uh, to lay the mine here and really waste the time doing that. So another question we have to ask ourselves is why was the mine exploded in the first place without any warning given uh, or any coordination with the Scottish uh, and Fairfax armies? Um, one of the reasons given is the mine was actually beginning to flood after the heavy rain that had been uh, coming down the previous couple of nights um, and it got to the point where either they would have lost the advantage of the mine or it would have been flooded completely and useless um, and so maybe Crawford decided it was time just to blow the mine and take the chances uh, and do and do the attack uh, straight afterwards. Um, other chronicles of the time say that Crawford was after some kind of personal glory um, but it can't, it can't really be kind of verified on that. It may be that it was just a, a poor coordination of the plans uh, and, and maybe the surprise attack, uh, which was a surprise to the <laughs> parliamentary commanders uh, as much as the uh, defenders, um, was planned to you know, surprise them and gain entry uh, and take advantage of whatever situation was. So here we have the bowling green and they charge across this landscape uh, but they were hampered by both high walls around the orchards and the gardens um, and the fact that they had men coming in behind them from Lendl Tower to steal the breach. Uh, up to 2,000 parliamentarians, sorry, 2,000 royalists converged on this corner, uh, taking the arms and taking position on the high ground and in the buildings and shooting fire down to trap Crawford's men in the crossfire of the of this corner of the of the king's manor, um, there is some reports that they actually got into the manor, where there was a little bit of hand to hand fighting, but generally uh, most of the men were cornered and trapped uh, in this area, and after the ammunition had begun to run out. So, with no diversion uh, or backup force uh, to relieve the situation, the attack was bound to fail. Um, and the, real, the only real chance of entering the city before Prince Rupert arrived was squandered. Um, it's interesting that a day after the siege, um, voices could be heard in the rubble um, of the collapsed tower, which had um, fell outwards. Um, the cries of water, water, help, help, were heard. Um, and as the, as the parliamentarians moved forward to try and help some of the people in it, they were fired upon. Um, as the besiegers thought it was another attack and it wasn't until three days later that a little truce was arranged uh, whereby they, both armies could step forward uh, and pick out any people alive uh, and those dead that were beginning to obviously decompose in the, in the summer sun uh, and give them a decent burial. So the siege continued um, without any real gain for two more weeks uh, until the news of Prince Rupert's army entering Nesborough reached the parliamentarian commanders. Uh, immediately they struck camp, marched west to Marston Moor, um, and in the hope of in intercepting Rupert's army um, from reaching York. However, the Prince had outmanoeuvred them and had speedily continued north to Boroughbridge uh, and on to Poppleton, north of York, and by July the 1st, he had an, an advance party into York to announce his arrival and the successful relief of the city. Um, so after three months of siege, York could breathe a sigh of relief. It had done its duty to King Charles and held its own. However, the always overconfident Prince Rupert defied the King's orders and also the sound advice of the Marquis of Newcastle, who was in, in the command of the garrison here, and immediately set off with his men for a confrontation at Marston Moor, um, with all the parliamentarian forces there to meet him. After the defeat at Marston Moor of the Royalist forces, uh, the loss of York, King Charles had no major Royalist army in the north, and because of this he suffered a mortal blow to his cause. It was then the beginning of the end for him, uh, and we all know what happened to him eventually in 1649. The beaten and demoralised forces of the Royalists um, streamed back in disorder into York uh, through Micklegate Bar um, where immediately 
the siege was resumed. Uh, but by July 15th, it was all over and York surrendered uh, to Parliament, but with very generous terms. Uh, much of the army in the garrison was allowed to march out uh, unmolested uh, and with its arms and armour uh, and drums beating. But York was in a sorry state and needed much rebuilding. A lot of damage to the outer suburbs had been done, a lot of damage to the wards had been done, and this all took time and money uh, to repair and replace in the coming years after the siege. Uh, Lord Fairfax was given command of the city, uh, whilst the armies of Leaven and Manchester moved off to confront other royalist garrisons in the area. As for the old tower at St Mary's, it was eventually rebuilt after the Civil War was over, but it was not the best of restorations. It was given a different conical tiled roof and the new section of the outer wall was rebuilt using reclaimed stone and damaged windows and door fittings from some of the battered buildings of the King's Manor. The stonemasons miscalculated the spherical shape of the walls and didn't manage to meet, match the original circumference and thus it is a crudely and obvious to see mismatched walls uh, that you can see there today. By the 18th and early 19th centuries, the old abbey walls had been totally built up against with rough shanty housing and tall, thin tenements. Much damage was caused to the original medieval walls by these additions. You can see this today with the scars and the marks of chimneys and, and cutouts in the, in the brickwork and inserted holes for support beams chiselled out. However, by the end of the 19th and early 20th century, many of these have been cleared away from the walls to reveal the limestone again. There's still many a scar from those days of the Civil War to be found on the ancient and long-standing walls around the city, and if only they could speak what tales they would tell. York's ancient defensive city walls have su survived war, fire, flood, plague, revolution, and even man's determination to modernise and demolish. They are intricately linked to the city's image and its rich and proud history. They continue to hold many secrets and are still a source of wonder and demand further interpretation. So when you pass by, stop a while, have a quick look at their beauty. Every stone, every hole, every mark on that wall has its very own history to tell. <laughs>